Welcome to the Ripcord Moment. I'm your host, Joe C2. Today we're joined by Joe Gerber. Joe's got two plus decades of experience at different executive leadership levels in the C-suite. His career focuses traditionally on growth and organizational transformation, and the industries he's had a variety of experience in over the many decades have been in aerospace, healthcare, and a variety of other industries. His experience includes private equity, working in turnaround situations, over 70 uh, deals completed on the buy side and sell side, whether they're mergers, acquisitions, recaps, et cetera. Uh, Joe, I'm really excited for our discussion today. And you've really cultivated this, this role as a, a CEO for hire, where you go into these different companies and you're able to really help uh, work with founders and then take those businesses really to the next level and institutionalize sort of the, the mom and pop businesses and taking them on to the next level. And also one of the things we're going to get into today is you've crafted this very thoughtful process on how to think through, how an owner can think through actually interviewing who is the right CEO uh, to help take the company to the next level. So Joe, excited our discussion today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, Appreciate so, being here. Absolutely. Well, you know, give us just a little bit of your background. You've got obviously a tremendous amount of experience and sort of what's brought you to where you are, uh, you know, at this point in your career today. So I spent uh, about 12 years in investment banking doing, as you said, buy side and sell side work. And uh, I had an opportunity to hop the fence and move into a leadership role, a president role at, uh, at a manufacturer and spent nine years there uh, growing the company and eventually uh, acting as the banker to sell it and, and had such a good time on the sell side or actually on the uh, on the operator side that I, mm -hmm. I stuck with it. So so here I am six companies later. And, uh, you know, besides running those six companies, I I've I've helped people interview and hire CEOs and and also coach them. Yeah, it's interesting. Your path almost seems perhaps maybe a, a bit reversed where I would imagine that a lot of people get experience running businesses, you know, coming out of business school and then they realize, gosh, this is a lot of work. You know, I want to have more fun after going through the transaction. Now I've been through a sale, you know, right. a merger, whatever it is, a recap. And I want to take that experience and go maybe into investment banking or consulting. Um, yeah, it seems like your experience was a little bit more the, the, the opposite. Well, I, you know, I, I found myself in banking and, and doing so many deals. I wondered, I, I, I would go in and, and meet with uh, either boards or or you know, the current ownership, of the company, and, and I tell them what they need to do to buff and polish the company, get it ready for sale. And oftentimes, you know, they look at me with, with this blank stare, like, what are you talking about? You know how much work that takes, right? And I was, I was the banker, I didn't understand what it took. And, and so, so when I hopped the fence, I, I, I quickly learned how difficult it is to, um, to really, um, to really move the needle and do it continuously over the years. And, and the experience in banking gave me, uh, gave me a, a, just a realization that, that you know, these business owners, um, they just had a lot of grit. Yeah. And a lot of, the, you know, a, a lot of the movement they made was just because they had the grit and they stuck with it. Sort of the and sheer so, willpower to push that sheer, water over the hill. Right, right. Yeah. But when I asked them, why, why are you selling? They would always tell me very much the same thing. You know, it's just like, I, I, I got into it because I was an engineer. I loved doing the design. I'm tired of dealing with the people issues or the work comp issues or the tax issues, you know, dealing with the ups and downs. I just, mm -hmm. I want to get back to do what I, what I fell in love with at the beginning, which was the engineering or the sales or, you know, the, the finance part of it. And so when I came into uh, the operator role, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty disciplined and, and I began to, to run the first company and I found that, that, you know, I hit this issue and the first issue I hit was a work comp issue, right? So I was pretty creative and tried to resolve the issue creatively. And I, I did that and I was excited and I'm like, okay, you know, you got that big win, right? Ready to grow, right? And then bam, next issue. And so you know, I figured out over the first nine years that I needed to step back from the business and create a process where I can just continually improve the business. I can continually um, assess the people and the talent. Mm -hmm. 
assess the, the new business coming in and the growth. And that actually made me feel a lot more comfortable about running the company because I was doing it more from an admission point of view. I was, I was taking that time to step back mm -hmm. and that over the years, over the, the six companies that I've, that I've run, um, really, uh, was a perfected model for, for how I step into a company for the first hundred days. And then, and then for that, that process until the company sold or I exit. So maybe you can give us kind of a high level overview of what your overall process is. And then I heard you mention the first hundred days, which I'm imagining is sort of this really in-depth analysis, evaluation period that your observation period. But Kevin, maybe give us an overarching sense of your process or, you know, walk us through the overall process and then more specifically uh, some of the details along the way. So the overall process is is really <clears throat> about capturing issues in the form of buckets. Okay. And so a bucket might be uh, talent, a bucket might be production, a bucket might be engineering, a bucket might be um, uh, um, marketing, right? And, and what I would do is throughout sort of the days and the weeks and the months, I would come upon an issue and it would go on the bucket list in the appropriate area. And then each week I would evaluate that bucket list and force rank each bucket for mm -hmm. what needs to happen, who needs to work on it and, and what's the timing of its solution. Okay. And so for me, it's a continuous improvement process for the company, but it allows me to give equal weight to all issues. And by doing that, and I, I'm, you know, taking that a bit from Covey's first things first book. Okay. Right, because it's first things first, you know, in a very simplified way is take all aspects of your life and set it equal and then set the goals to accomplish those things and then back those up into these micro things you can do to accomplish the goals. And so if I take that into the business environment and say, okay, a, a company has, let's say, 10 different buckets, right? And if there's a, a safety issue or I'm having some talent issues or whatever, all those things go on the bucket list. They get force ranked based on sort of the need to complete right away. And then I can assign those out. And then in my weekly meetings, I can then, I can ask each department about what they're doing to advance those areas and keep them on track. And then I can manage the company basic, basically on a, you know, what's working and what's not. Are we on track or off track? Sure. Right? Okay. And then allow the ownership of the issues to, to be at the level it needs to be. So I'm a big, big fan of, of each department is a functional area and there's functions and accountability, right? So if I step back from that and look at, uh, you know, what are the functional areas? Are they working? Are we not? Who's responsible? Are they keeping it on track, off track and so forth, right? But when I step into a business, uh, no matter how large, uh, I, do, I do an assessment and this is taken from sort of Roosevelt's famous 1933 speech where he, uh, you know, he talked about the first hundred days. And yeah. so CEOs are measured by hundred days. Presidents are measured by hundred days. So what I do is I measure myself by the first hundred days and it helps me set expectations with the board uh, or with the folks that I'm working for. Mm -hmm. I come in and, and through the first hundred days, I, um, I assess the company in a lot of different areas. And then pull that information together and force rank it into an action plan for the first hundred days so that I'm getting all the information I need from all perspectives. I may interview the board. I may interview senior management, distill down what's working and what's not working. And then, and then lay out that plan. And within the first hundred days, I'll have a reset of the management team in case there needs to be any change management there. Okay. And I'll have a, basically a large force rank list of issues. And, and then I'll forget that. Yeah. It, well, and I would imagine through this sort of process that you're going through, you're obviously fleshing out what critical issues there are. You're coming up with this action plan. Do you find that that helps to build the trust with the owner? Because I have to imagine that that's one of the most critical issues that you deal with when you're dealing with, especially a founder, right? right. Uh, who, right. Who's you know entrepreneur that started this business. This is a huge leap to actually hand over the reins yeah. to somebody else who, um, in many ways, I would imagine is somewhat of a stranger, right? Maybe you've had some relationship with them, but you're being referred in. And so 
thing. This building of the trust, I got, I have to imagine, huge. is so critical. It's huge. So I do that in a couple ways. The first is uh, I interview the owner. And I interview the owner the same way I interview the management team. Okay. About what's working and what's not working. All of the information gets distilled down and shared back with the owner. Okay. So basically, um, he's, he's seeing everything or she's seeing everything that I'm seeing. Right. Um, and then the second way I build the trust is I do what I say I'm going to do. So I go in and to the extent that there's things that need to get changed, I've already shared that back with the owner and, and, and had the feedback on that. Well, you know, Joe, you, you have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. I tried that 20 years ago. Right. right. Or, or it's like, okay, they really said that. Oh, that's really an issue. Or uh -huh. right. So we can have that conversation. And then I can lay out an extended plan to accomplish these things. But within the early part of the 100 day plan, I'm getting early wins. Okay. Okay. I'm making some changes that either the owner thought was really important or that we agreed would be something that would move the needle pretty early on. And that tends to help out quite a bit. And are these like small, I mean, everywhere, small. like little small wins, yeah. but just so that you're not disrupting the culture, right. you're not coming in like saying, hey, this is, because change is not comfortable, right? For, right. for, for right. most organizations, right? Right. So, so there's, there's a couple analogies, right? They, 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 who moved my cheese is a perfect example. You know, that's just, <laughs> right? People absolutely don't like to change. Right. But but I remind the the owner of the board that I'm there because and not to their fault, but whatever was going on before wasn't working. It just wasn't working. Yeah. It just wasn't working. I'm there because things need to change. Mm -hmm. Right. I talk to people about change and we talk about how change is going to be a constant. But if you're OK with and participating in the decisions, then it's not that bad. Right. Right. And, and the other thing you mentioned is like coming in like a bull in a china shop, right? That's something that I don't do and I don't recommend to anybody. Yeah. And by the way, um, the Mythbusters on Discovery Center actually put a bull in a china shop and the bull walked delicately in and around the china. They added more bulls and all the bulls walked delicately in and around the china. So I use the term bull in a china shop because people understand what it is. But sure. I have to mention that <laughs> it's actually the opposite occurs. Right. Um, I come in and I actually present myself as the village idiot when I walk into the room. I'm not, look, I, I'm not in engineering. I haven't been part of the company. I ask a lot of questions. I'm very interested in what's happening. Why do we do it like this? Why is this not working? And by asking the questions, I'm feeling for two things. One is for for sensitivities around issues, right? And 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 maybe a bit more is sometimes people or departments are so defensive of the way they do things because they're so afraid of change that yeah. I know that I can't hit that one head on. I have to actually bring them into the solution and get them to the solution on their own. And then it's their solution and, sure. and, and it works. Yeah, got it. Um... All right. So th this is kind of you walked us through the first hundred days. You've done your evaluation. You've knocked out some small wins. Yeah. And and so at the end of the hundred days, is that when you? I'm imagining that's when you're presenting your findings to the CEO or to the to the owner no. before then. There's a there's typically a you know if it's a CEO or or chairman, uh, it's it's typically a weekly check in for the first hundred days. Okay. Um, it just keeps uh, it keeps them sort of in the process. But okay. um, usually at about 60 days, I've changed out the 60 to 75 days. I've changed out the management team if that's what is required. Okay. So I, the, the, the evaluation is very early. You know, I conduct a search. Mm -hmm. uh, that search is going on in parallel. Uh, I've looked at sort of major issues. And, and in the back half of the 90 days, um, I'm hitting my stride. Okay. And, and that's where uh, the owner is basically seeing or the board is basically seeing that that we're accomplishing some, some pretty cool is. things. The yeah. momentum's there. Yeah. And the reason why it's about 100 days is because it's the first quarter. So typically, when mm -hmm. I've gone into a company, right, 30 days after the end of the quarter, I have a board meeting. Yeah. Right. And 
the question at the, every board meeting is what have you done for me lately? Yep. Right. So that's, that's the marker for me as a CEO to, to walk in there and say, this is where you were, this is where you are today. And this is what I plan on accomplishing over the next three quarters. Yeah. So let's maybe we can pivot the conversation. You've given us kind of an outline of, of uh, what you're doing. Well, one last question actually on your process. Uh, what is your, I guess, the, your sort of system that you use, or do you have one in terms of tracking these various initiatives that you want to uh, accomplish? Are you doing this in a, you know, a certain type of software, Excel? I mean, a good old notepad. What, you know, what's the Joe Gerber method of staying organized? So I don't buy a cantaloupe without spreadsheeting it. So I, I spreadsheet everything. So, so basically I have one workbook. I have tabs in the workbook. I have that bucket list, right? The okay. 10 or 15 different areas. That's on tab one, let's say. The 100 day plan is on tab two. Any issues or contacts that I need are in tab three. I just run this workbook so that it's virtual. It's, it's wherever I am. I tend to walk mm -hmm. around with a printed bucket sheet okay. in my back pocket when I'm walking around. I, I can't sit in my office during this process. Yeah. I'm, I'm almost 90% in the company, in the field, yeah. meeting customers, yeah. you know, trade shows, wherever. So, so okay. I need to be on the fly. So you've created this sort of systematized sort of business plan. It sounds like that you use for every time you go into a company. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, that's helpful. So now let, let's kind of pivot the conversation to your process that you coach people through if they're thinking about hiring a CEO for hire, sure. you know, kind of like you, what does that look like? What are sort of your critical interview questions and how, yeah, walk us through that. Okay. So there's, there, there's a, there's a handful of things that I found useful in looking to hire a CEO and, and the, the least useful really is, is, um, you know, experience. And, and I say that because, because, you know, experience is pretty easy to figure out. Uh, either by sort of resume, background checks, uh, checking the person out within the industry and so forth, you know, what's the person done? The more important issue for me is always, and this is sort of a one third, two thirds thing is uh, sort of personality, cultural fit, mm -hmm. adaptability, uh, how goal oriented is the person um, and, and the balance between uh, really the the industry knowledge and the financial knowledge. So I say that because um, when I when I've coached people or helped people hire CEOs, um, I look at you know, people fall into really three and a half types. Uh, um, and I'll go over the half a type first. The half a type <laughs> is the 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 child or or, or um, the child of a family business. Mm -hmm. Right. Or maybe that child doesn't have the personality that or the skills or the drive or whatever other sort of features that the former that the parent has. And so and so that's the half. And that's not really a hiring situation. But sometimes that CEO was in that family business and then exited. And so they their CEO experience doesn't come from a traditional CEO experience, which is right. the other three categories. And the other three categories are basically the engineer, scientist, tech type, right? The financial type, yeah. right? Or, or like a sales. CFO for higher background or accounting background, right? Or yeah. the or the sales type, right? Sales. And so yeah. you have to look at the you have to look at the culture and you have to look at what you want to accomplish to to determine sort of which type you're you're really wanting to hire. So you have a lot of engineer types that may not have an MBA. And the, you know, the, the plus with them is that let's say your, your, your company is a very sort of engineering based company, then great. They're a great fit. They'll understand the business really well. Maybe they're a great cultural fit, but they're always going to be, their weakness is going to be tying the, um, the business itself and the operations to the financial right. performance. And how do I, how do I grow a company? Because growing a company um, has great working capital demands. Yep. And you sort of have to understand that on the fly. So the weakness of an engineer science type that doesn't have an MBA, let's say, is, is that they're, they, they may have a sort of a, that, uh, that weakness in, in finance. The financial type uh, is just, just pause the that real quick, Joe, because I think there's one interesting point I want to try and flesh out here, and that is sure. 
identifying the type of individual, but also the life cycle of the business, right? Because you mentioned the word growth, right? And the working right. capital need. And so I would imagine that if a business that was more in steady state, not in growth mode, if you have more of the engineer type, perhaps they might be more appropriate for a business at a different life cycle. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I, one of the six companies I've run, I was hired to do thoughtful growth, maintain steady state. Yeah. The issue there is that our customers wanted us to grow. Yeah. And so then we began to grow and we, we were growing very quickly and the, the, the owner and the board didn't really grasp like why we should grow. And, and I said, look, you know, the, the, the customer basically said it's either you or somebody else. So right. it's gotta be us. <laughs> and so, and so um, the, the thing is that we grew very quickly that year, but we had to plan the working capital so that all of our money wasn't tied up in inventory. It was actually flushed through into product. So that's super important. And, sure. and, and, and oftentimes companies want to grow before they sell. So yeah. CEOs are brought in to basically, you know, you know, five year growth, sell the company and, and, and exit. So financial okay. types, so yep. financial types, right. They'll come in and, and sometimes the board or the CEO uh, or the board of the chairman will bring in a ex CFO to run the company. The, the challenge there is that <clears throat> The and if they want the company to grow, the the typically the CFO won't be growth oriented. They'll be sort of cash focused, right? right. And, and this, this Focusing on the cost, right? yeah, right. cost and cash <laughs> right. and everything else, right? And they'll end up constraining the the the, the business in terms of its flexibility, um, and so that's that's typically a challenge. But look, you know, personalities weigh in here as well, and and there's been a lot of great financial types that have grown companies. Um, the sales types, you know, are are sort of like the engineer scientist types, and they're they are very much sort of growth driven, and they'll come in and they'll talk about, hey, I, I grew this, I grew this, I grew this, I could grow your thing, and and you know, they may even have a bit of an engineering background, which is really great. So you'll get that growth. The thing to look out for, though, is that oftentimes they can be outside the company selling. Mm -hmm. And not looking at or not focused on, right, the, the production, the design, the quality, some of these factors, along sure. with the financial piece. So okay. so what I try to do when I interview is I figure out who I'm interviewing and then I'm asking questions about the other areas. Yeah. That they may not, not have. Are they fleshing out right. the there? Yeah. Right. So simple questions. Um uh, you know, around the, their understanding of working capital. If it's a manufacturing business, you know, you want to understand, do they really understand uh, how cash flows through a manufacturing business? And, and if you increase the demands on, on um, basically the growth, the sales, yeah. right? What does that do to inventory? And what does that do to cash? And what's their capabilities in terms of, 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 of that understanding? Um, Look, I don't I don't have an engineering degree, but I spent a couple of years in engineering mm -hmm. and then um, an MBA and then, and then in the financial world. And and so I do think that if you if you bring somebody in as a CEO and they have a bit of experience in a couple of areas, it's it's really worthwhile okay. uh, for the company. But I would say that that uh personality and and cultural fit adaptability is is really really, really key. critical yeah really critical because you know they you know losing somebody you know the, the for me uh the biggest challenge i have in being a ceo and i know this is my challenge and i learned this a long time ago is basically um seeing issues as just issues more like speed bumps than walls right I love and that all, analogy. That's a good analogy. Yeah. Right. Because because for a CEO he is faced with an issue, right? They they could be paralyzed on that issue for and lose a lot of ground, right? Yeah. And, and and the just the the management the oversight goes away. Yeah. So so if if all the issues just hit the bucket list, somebody is in charge of of you know somebody owns the issue and then yeah. and then you're monitoring it. It, it yeah. tends to work really well. Empowering your team to help be part of the solution. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Um, well, we're, we're these, these are great concepts, Joe. I, you know, we could spend a whole day talking about your process, but 
you know, this idea of the cultural fit, identifying the type, focusing the interview around their strengths and weaknesses. I think lining up the personality type with the right, the right sort of stage of the company and that first hundred day onboarding process you have really hammered through. Um, what would you say, you know, as we kind of wind up our discussion today, I always like to ask our guests for what we call two action items for when we call it the ripcord moment, when an owner actually goes to sell the business, right? It's my belief that they have to have their parachute, that ripcord can't fail. And so it's right. better to be prepared ahead of time. What are two action items that owners should consider sooner than later? If they're thinking about this sort of transition to institutionalizing their business, bringing in outside professional advisors like yourself, what are some of those things they should do? Well, I think that if they're if they're looking to sell a company in five years or so, and and they they're at the point where they want to bring in a CEO to to just sort of drive the business through its last growth cycle, yeah, um, it, it's it'll um, it'll allow them to step back a bit and be a true chairman or be a, a true um, uh, sort of coach to that CEO, uh, but. Um, this process, I would say sort of two action items are, you know, using a process like this allows that owner um, to be a bit objective about uh, what's working and what's not with a company and okay. getting that all fixed and trued up and figured out well in advance, well in advance of that five year sort of last growth period, super, super key. Okay. Um, and then look, you know, the you know, buyers are really smart and they go in and and you don't really want to do anything that's going to disrupt the business or cause the business to go off course over mm -hmm. the sort of five year period prior to the, the sale. But it's a great opportunity to augment the management team and and um, uh, get the floor laid out properly, uh, really get the company buffed and polished well in advance. And that way, on the look back, you know, the buyer's looking back a few years and goes, wow, this is a really well-run, great management yeah. team. Uh, things are going off the door. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's all set. Wonderful. Well, Joe, that's, the, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time today to share with us sure. your experience, your pearls of wisdom, some of your processes. If anyone in our audience would like to get a hold of you, uh, how might they reach you? All right, my LinkedIn profile, I'm easily uh, able to be contacted through that. Oh, well, Joe, Thanks again for your time. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up. This is Joe C2 signing off from the Ripcord Moment, and we'll see you next time.